Welcome back to part two of our conversation with designated drinker, Dr. Marsha Chatlin, professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University and Pulitzer Prize winning author of Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. So if you've missed any of part one, go back and belly up to that bar and give it a listen first. We promise to save a seat right here for you. So Marsha, in part one, uh, went through your journey through, through from journalism to academia, and we kind of touched on your books, but I really, really want to get into that now, if you don't mind. Can you help us take that deep dive and give us a little bit about about your book, give us the in, your inspiration behind that? Absolutely. So I wrote a book <laughs> called Franchise um, because I had spent uh, many years when I was in graduate school at Brown in Providence, Rhode Island, um, you know, learning more about the food justice movement that was emerging and some of the alternative food systems that people were thinking through as they were trying to think about access to foods and, you know, nutrition and diet and all of these things. And I was reading books like Diet for New America by John Robbins that was talking about the environmental impact of meat and um, advocating for plant-based diets. So I was learning a lot about different things. And one of the aspects of this, um, educational process that was always really unsettling was the ways that people talked about how particularly poor people, particularly poor people of color, how they ate and what they ate and what they fed their kids and particularly around fast food. So how could someone let their kids eat that? Blah, 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 blah. It felt judgy and really unnecessary. And as a historian, my job, I think, is to use history to make people more empathetic and thoughtful about their positions in the world and about populations that have been rendered vulnerable because of inequality. So long story short, I wanted to tell the story of how McDonald's appears as such a fixture in urban communities and why that's a process and there's nothing inevitable about it. And so what I wanted to do was tell the civil rights history of McDonald's, meaning how did McDonald's, which was a brand that had grown up in all white suburbs throughout the 1950s, how does it land in places like Chicago and Detroit, um, you know, the black part of Los Angeles and St. Louis and Kansas City? And what I found was it was a direct response to Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination so interesting. in which you know, not unlike the George Floyd summer of 2020 and other major inflection points in the country's, uh, you know, desire to perhaps address racial injustice, but to address it in really insufficient ways, a lot of businesses were talking about going into Black communities and Black business ownership. And, you know, the idea that a McDonald's franchise would be considered salvific or, you know, the answer to race relations seems ridiculous to us in some ways. Um, in our vantage point, but from the perspective of someone in 1968 who sees this major um, corporation, the first publicly traded fast food restaurant, saying we're going to open the doors to opportunity, you know, people were really excited about the prospects. And I talk about how major players in the civil rights movement, major players in the federal government were really um, encouraging and incredibly supportive of this idea of fast food franchising as a bridge to opportunity. And it has consequences. It had consequences in the immediate moment and has had consequences five decades later. But I wanted to help us take a step back and say, okay, when we have these moments of tension, when we have these mo moments of racial unrest, when we look to the business sector to answer those questions, this is the kind of stuff we get. Oh, and it it isn't a perfect solution. But I also wanted to acknowledge that, you know, fast food is sometimes practical. It's sometimes fun. It's sometimes interesting. And I wanted to be critical of this response to racial injustice, but also acknowledge the reasons why people really like McDonald's and why it's sometimes a tough sell to sell to tell someone to stop eating fast food altogether if they don't understand the role those fast food companies have had in communities and in making inroads into groups that had been left behind by many other industries. That's so interesting. I it, it, I. I obviously have not read the book and I can't wait to because this is, I, I find it so incredibly fascinating because it's easy to demonize it, but to, to see it from a different point of view and scrape back or pull back some of those layers and look at um, this from, from another lens altogether. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's mind, it's 
eye-opening, I guess is what I, I should say, um, and that you're shedding light into a space that um, very few of us even understand. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, one of the best parts about writing about McDonald's is that there's a reference point that a lot of people understand. Uh, very few people don't know what a McDonald's is. Very few people yeah. haven't been to McDonald's. But what can it reveal to us about really complicated parts of American history and, you know, things that we still struggle with today? And so I I can't believe that this weird book that I wrote about McDonald's <laughs> has been so well received. Um, you know, and, and in some ways, uh, I was taking a little bit of a risk by, you know, helping or asking people to trust me that there's something there on the other side of the story. But I think when people read it, they they say, oh, I never thought about that. Or, you know, the way that McDonald's in many ways can serve as a Rorschach yeah. of how we see society and who we are. For African-American readers of my book, they say, yeah, I totally remember the guy who franchised the McDonald's. He was a figure in our community. And when I was on the road with the book, uh, sometimes white listeners would say, you know, what are you talking? I would never know who franchised my local fast food restaurant. And I was like, well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The proximity that people have to these businesses and what they do in communities, I think is really revelatory of how race has lived in America. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would absolutely not know a single person who owned a franchise. Uh, actually, somebody asked me, I'm in my branding life, somebody asked me about franchising uh, a, 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 an IHOP, I believe, a, a breakfast place. I think it was an IHOP. Um, and I had so little, it, it was like such a foreign thought to me that you would franchise a fast food restaurant, but um, it, that was absolutely what he wanted to do. And I had nothing to offer because I had no insights on it from any kind of branding I live in whatsoever. this world. So yeah. You guys are talking about this, and like I, I know a lot of franchise owners, and uh, they're generally not white Americans for sure. So they're not Black Americans. They're not. Um, they're not American. A lot of people now. So, well, this is something that um, you know some members of Congress have really been trying to scrutinize. So getting into McDonald's, you have to have millions of dollars. Like this is not for the everyday person. Yeah. But there are a lot of franchises that have very low like entry points financially Dunkin donuts. subway no. dunkin donuts Krispy Kreme. um there are these franchises that often recruit among immigrant mm -hmm. communities and it, it can be very 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 risky if you are undercapitalized and you take on a franchise because the whole business model in my opinion is to pass liability on to another person yeah. so you know that's that's like essentially what it is because yes um you own the restaurant, giant asterisk, but you're paying rent, you're leasing equipment, you're paying fees. You don't decide when you can get a better deal on tomatoes or if you run an IHOP, if you have a hookup on strawberries, you can't buy them outside of the approved vendor network. Um, if someone robs your store, you're on the hook. Yep. If your employees like call out sick, you're on the hook. So it's um. It's. I think it's the most American business model because it's like you get to own something that you don't really own. It's like how I say I own my house, but do I really? I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, I'm like 27 years from that happening. And so all of this is to say the promise of franchising and why it was so appealing, particularly to African-Americans in the late 1960s, is that there are so few opportunities for business ownership. There's so few yeah. opportunities to get good loans from banks. And the franchise tells you, you know, we've done all the difficult thinking for yeah. you. And it doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter where you come from. This is something that can make you rich. And I think that there's this um, appealing, democratized idea of business ownership that comes through franchising that is really appealing. Sure. That McDonald's thing is, um, I haven't read your book and I promise you I will because franchising is a big deal for me. Like I just keep thinking about like how people do that. But McDonald's is an interesting, uh, very interesting one to do because McDonald's owns all their land. Yeah. So 100%. So it's exactly a real estate it. play. Yeah. And um, and then they have brands like Chick, you know, Chick fil A. You did Chick fil A, right? And Chick fil A has been since 1960s. And, um, they're interesting, too, because you have to work for the brand in order to get yep. that store. Now, Chick-fil-A doesn't own 100% of everything that they 
open, but if it's outside of like a strip, they will own that little like, you know, landing pad, but they usually do it in conjunction with like a Home Depot or a big box something, right? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. So basically what they're appealing to, it's, it's so fascinating how they did this, but I will say that some of the newer franchise and not so much the um, old school franchise, but the newer ones that are coming up, like the, um, you know, let's do local here in DC. Let's do Kava, for yeah. example, right? Kava, um, Sweet Green, stuff like that. They're really mindful about who does franchise and, um, or it's a part of like opening another store or something like that. So they're, I think they're still considered a chain, but they might, they're getting into the franchising side and, some people can make a lot of money, you know, like they can, but you're right. It's, it's set up so, by design to fail. I mean, listen, I, I mean, I feel ridiculous saying this to you, the, the food industry, you know, the restaurant business, that is tough. Like you, Very um, slim you could margins. have, you can be the smartest person in the room and you still don't make it for, for, you know, issues outside of your control. Um, so the fast casual brands are so interesting because a lot of them aren't franchises. They're chains, yeah. right? Like you were saying, so Sweet Green Kava, you can't franchise them. Not yet. But they, not yet. It's exactly. coming. Exactly. And so the question is, you know, like from a capital perspective, is it worth it? I personally, no one has asked me and no one cares my opinion. I personally think that the fast casual brands are hard to franchise because of the type of product that they serve. Because I, I think that like when you're dealing with McDonald's, they drive the supply prices, right? McDonald's can tell you how much they're going to pay for potatoes and you're going to do it because it's fucking McDonald's. Exactly. Like they're going to yep. buy at the levels. But when you're talking about things that are like um, cut produce, things that have zero shelf life and you are – dealing with a and, and you're trying to say like we um we buy from local suppliers good yeah. luck because there's so much complexity in that and that's the other thing i um all i know is mcdonald's and franchising in african-american communities <laughs> what i pretend to know are supply chain <laughs> issues and the dynamics of restaurant ownership so like i will stay in my lane to the extent that i i need to but i will say this it is a tough tough model for the people who um try to assume franchises because um do you remember when everyone was on atkins oh yes. my god that was like the fucking worst it's like eat a fucking slice of bread <laughs> <laughs> um but when everyone was on atkins right like the industries had to figure out you know wraps or lettuce you know lettuce and all the stuff and you know the price of flour is compromised because there's no demand for you know flour then everyone's like oh yeah i want to eat bread and then flour goes up right like all of those things mcdonald's has a mechanism or you know the big companies have a mechanism for um for factoring in those those things like eggs are like a million dollars now um these smaller outfits you know this is going to be really tough but um you know what do i know I also thought Trump wasn't going to win the election, so let me shut up. <laughs> you know what oh, I know? You know what I know, drink. Gina? You just mentioned that name. Yeah, let's – Oh, now you're driving us to drink, Marsha. It's I all, mean, let's, let's do it. Yeah, we're going to make a cocktail. <laughs> Chamomile punch, right? Come on. Sounds so delicious. It's my, one of my favorite things to make. But one thing about punch is that you normally can't make it for just yourself. So I broke down this recipe a little bit and made it so that you can um, infuse your um, gin – um, ahead of time, you can check, catch that on um, Instagram if you want to know how to do it. I'll run through the recipe really quick. You're going to take a half a cup of dried chamomile, and then you're going to add um, a half a cup of gin. You can use the gin that you like, anything in the 94, 95 range of proof is good because it's um, it'll infuse pretty quickly. And what you're left with is this really beautiful golden uh, liquid, which I absolutely love and smells really good. So we're gonna use that and you can keep it, once you've strained it off, you can keep that gin for a long time. But I always say if you have an infusion, keep it in the refrigerator after it's done infusing and after you've strained off the fruit or um, herbs. Cause if you don't, then you have like, you're inviting like the next layer of, uh, of um, bacteria to start doing its thing or yeast or whatever is floating around your house. I don't know you, so you know, it could be whatever, right? In this cocktail, you have um, two ounces of the infused gin. And we're gonna pour that in. And then we have one ounce of um, Cointreau, which is an orange um, 
an orange brandy, really, if you will. I love Cointreau, it smells so good. I am a big fan. I just realized I have to make two drinks, so don't know why I just did that, so I will make one more. Um, and then we're gonna add lime juice. So if you are um, a savvy cocktail maker, you'll realize this is the beginning of somewhat of a cosmopolitan, which is, you know, kind of, or a pegu club, which is, um, you know, what they consider a mother cocktail, meaning that most cocktails stem from these kind of recipes. But this is a really lovely um, drink. So now we're gonna add uh, a little bit of Angostura, which is a bitter, and I can't open it, so let's uh, try that again. Uh, well, Ango, one, two, three, four. I like four, we'll do five, we'll do an extra one just because, why not? Um, you know, but bitter the way you like it. If you don't like bitter, skip it. If you love bitter, it's over bitter. You really can't do this wrong. You can always turn this drink into a flip by adding an egg white. Not necessary though, because we're gonna shake this and then strain it over fresh ice, which I'm just gonna grab real quick. And there we go. So we're gonna rock your glass all the way to the top and then we're gonna fill our shaker top to all the way to the top, which is three quarters full. So when you read the recipe, you know what that means. And we're gonna give it a shake. All right, now that's nice and frothy and you get this really pretty pink hue, we will strain this about halfway over your ice. We'll give this one to Louise and we'll put the other one. Um, thank you. So I love to garnish, you know, what, what's now in this time of year and like little flowers are starting to come out, but you know, sometimes we forget that there are like stems to these little flowers. So we're gonna put um, in there just a, a little bit of marigold uh, stems and they have this, or sometimes it's called black mint. And uh, it's just really, just really quite lovely and uh, fun. Cheers. Oh, Gina, this drink is so delicious. Marsha, you're just missing out. You definitely have to make this one at home. So my husband loves cocktail everything. We have way too many cocktail um, accoutrement for people who never drink and have a two-year-old. <laughs> but we have the bitters. We have the Cointreau. Um, we have all sorts of gins. We like. Do you have um, tea at home? All you have to do is take a half a cup of gin and, we have, and yeah. then just do it one hour, one hour or less. No, that's perfect. No, we have totally have chamomile. I can. I think I can make this at home tonight. Yeah, it's super easy. It's super easy. Where is she going to go to get this recipe? Oh, you're going to go to designateddrinker.show for the recipes, how to infuse. You can catch us on Instagram to see that infusion in case you have any questions. Yep. And if you missed it, designateddrinker.show. Or you can just scroll down into our episode notes. We'll have links um, to the recipes, to the how, the tips and tricks, as well as how you get to uh, Marsha's book. And if any of you missed that, it's Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. I, I'm like obsessed already. And remember, Pulitzer Prize winning. Don't yeah. forget that part. I have a question. For Do that. it. Can I ask? Yes. So how do you Absolutely. win the Pulitzer Prize? Like what happens? They call you up? Oh. Is there an award ceremony? Do you wear a gown? I'm, I'm glad I you need asked, to know. I, I'm gonna. I'm glad you asked this question because it's bananas. <laughs> so, so 2020 happened to all of us, and it was the worst. And um, so in March of 2021, um, my son was born, and um, my husband and I adopted our son with literally maybe. 12 hours notice wow it was like an 80s sitcom where the social worker said there's a baby available for adoption wow. you know are you guys ready and we're like uh sure and so that morning we went to target we bought all the stuff shut like, up and then no literally it was it was bananas and this was kind of some people were vaccinated others weren't yet oh i didn't just, think about that kind part of strange oh world. my god yeah yeah so um we brought him home and he was like 10 out of 10 best baby in the whole world like the <laughs> cutest so um you know so we were just immersed in that part of our life right it's like yeah. there's nothing but this baby feeding sleeping eating whatever so um i so i 
so books for the Pulitzer Prize can you can nominate your own book or your publisher nominates you and like your publisher is in charge of kind of sending your books out for awards and so I wanted it to be in competitions for like nerdy history prizes that only professional historians <laughs> know and so like I was like you know make sure you send it into this but I never in a million years would I request or even expect for my book to be sent to that so I didn't like really know so long story short, the way that it was usually done was there'd be like an in-person announcement in New York, and they had pushed the announcement date in hopes they could be in person, but they couldn't. So they did the announcement on um, YouTube, and then what? I didn't know the announcement was happening. Yeah, I didn't know the announcement was happening because I'm not going to fucking win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> so I went to, to run errands. Yeah. I come back home. And this is like perfect. So I have this bagel from Bullfrog Bagels, like a sandwich that I picked up on my way home. I'm so hungry. I might not have eaten for five days. Who knows with this baby, right? <laughs> so I get home and I'm about to eat the bagel. The baby wakes up. He's crying. He has to eat first, obviously. So I sit down to give my son a bottle and I'm like looking at my phone while I'm giving him a bottle. And on Twitter, it says that I've just won the Pulitzer Prize. That's crazy. And so I'm like oh, I'm so sleep deprived. I've just made this up. I finally have lost it. Like, you know, I've had a baby for seven weeks and this is the moment where the, you know, the the line between reality and fantasy is gone because I'm so tired. So I look at my phone and I'm like, what is this? What is this? So I've decided it is a bot that is playing a trick on writers. And I've been tagged in this post. I think it's mean. I'm like linking it to Trump. Like I do all things. And I'm just like, this is a bot. And this is the Trump, um, you know, administration, like messing with me. But why exactly me? I can't figure out what's happening. And so I go on YouTube to watch it. So I watch it on YouTube. And it actually really happened. But now I've become weird and paranoid and exhausted. And I still haven't eaten my bagel. So I just look at i'm just looking at my son going michael what's happening michael what's happening he has no answers for me and then my phone starts ringing and like getting text messages all these things that are happening but it still doesn't feel real so i just go up to his nursery and i sit there till my husband comes home because <laughs> i'm like so freaked out i don't it's so weird i have no there's no reason to be afraid nothing bad happens but because of just the time we were in and the environment it was just so strange and so then it like actually happened and so um you know, my my husband called my sister and was like, what kind of champagne do we buy for this occasion? The most expensive yeah, this, kind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, long story short, um, you know, they kept on having to delay the awards because they were like, oh, we're going to do this great thing. And then it was like Omicron happened. And then, um, no, first it was Delta and then yeah. Omicron. So blah, blah, blah. Finally, in June of 2022, they had an awards at um, Columbia University. Um, they used to have a dinner with someone like, you know, like Jennifer Hudson performing. But for our class, the COVID classes, it was like a graduation. Like, get your certificate, Aww. take a picture and get out. So and my, my baby still hadn't been vaccinated yet. So we my husband and I went to the ceremony. It was so exciting. But we were like, should we eat indoors? We don't know what to do. So I didn't go to the reception. <sighs> But my friend in New York who had a rooftop threw me a party. Oh, so we got a deli trade from Murray's. We got all of this. Um, oh, God, I can't remember the champagne that I got. Tons of champagne. And I had a little party with my friends. But the best part was that my son could come. Yeah. He was wearing a romper. He looked adorable. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think the long story short of this is that um, what I have discovered in becoming a parent is that your kid will always be the best thing that happens in any given year. Like if we didn't have our son, 2021 would have been like the year I won the Pulitzer prize. I promptly forgot about it because anytime someone would say congratulations, I'm like, I know, isn't my son the Aww. cutest? And they're like, Oh, they're like, Oh, you have a kid. I'm like, isn't that what we're talking about? So I just, you know, again, this is some, these are things that I could not imagine, but everything happened in the right time. And it's very exciting. Isn't that a big old, piece of humble pie Good that's amazing Lord. that's amazing so what does a what is it so it's a certificate oh what is it okay so a medal is only given to people who win in the um service journalism category so there are no medals for most of us you get a like a diploma kind of certificate which i got framed at a michael store and this lady is like is this real <laughs> <laughs> She's like, did you print this at home and come to Michael's with a coupon for it? <laughs> um, and then, because framing is so expensive. And then, Agreed, um, too expensive. 
And then what you get, I didn't know because I didn't go to the reception, is they have these paperweights with like Joseph Pulitzer's face on oh. them um, that they give you from Tiffany, which is like, I guess, a special yeah. like, order item. And so like a month, a few months later, someone's like, uh, we still have this in the office and I had no idea about it. So that's what I have like out in the living room. So and then cool. I have the actual prize framed in my office. That's that cool. is so cool. Now I'm going to bring this back to true crimes for you really quick. But... <laughs> So when you write your oh fantasy God. novel, like when you write the, your your non um, your fictional novel, you can write. Um, and then he picked up the he picked up my Pulitzer Prize off the coffee table and smacked him in the head. You know, <laughs> right. you yeah, could exactly. do the whole thing. It can be the murder weapon. Yes, I know. yes, death by it's Pulitzer. So funny. It's like it's the same thing. I mean, it's kind of like death by Pulitzer. <laughs> you know why I I use McDonald's as a way to talk about you know America's racial past. It's like you have to have something that everyone has familiarity with to take them to that next place. And for good and for bad, true crime has become such a strange cultural phenomenon that attracts a lot of people. That you can use that as a way of saying, okay, here are some messed up things about the criminal justice system. Here's a history behind you know why this case was perceived in this way. I find it a very useful tool. And you know, I grew up in the '80s, so everything in the 80s was about how like someone was going to kidnap you or something bad was going to happen. So I think culturally when you grow up in that stranger danger era, you're drawn to these stories because you have been conditioned to just be obsessed so with them. So two things on that note. Um, true crime genre is the largest category, most watched, most sought after category in every medium. Podcast, TV, radio, any medium. Yeah. Yeah, it's death. most consumed. Yeah. And it's because you feel better that it didn't happen to you. It's that, yeah. that's that yeah. emotional trigger why people are drawn to it. Second thing, when you talked about we grew up in the danger, uh, for stranger danger. White man. It, well, here's the thing. Do you know yes. that? So it started with uh, America's Most Wanted. And they had all these inflated numbers that everyone was being kidnapped. It was something crazy. It was different of, and I'm, I'm, pulling these out of my pocket right now but it's something like they they had said that there were 560,000 children abduct, abducted that year the truth of the matter was it was more like 65 children which still is terrible for those 65 families not belittling that at all but the numbers were sort of grossly in, inflated they use global numbers they use things like the dad didn't pick the child up from school in time or the or the or the parent took the kid overnight and it became it was kidnapped. No, it wasn't. You had a fight. Your husband took your, your kid for a night like it would take took all these things and inflated. And that's why that genre is what it is today. Well, I still I mean, panic. There's a white van. <laughs> So <laughs> as you should. No, I mean, it's all I mean, there's some real garbage aspects of this genre, not only the overinflation, um, you know, getting people to not be critical of the criminal justice system, yeah. the failures of policing, like you name it. But the thing that I think is really interesting is how terribly gendered it is, yeah. because a lot of true crime is this idea that women should know better. They make poor choices and then bad things happen to them. Yeah. I mean, this is like the whole narrative arc of Dateline NBC. And again, I grew up watching this stuff. It's so bad. We used to watch it all oh, the time. It was like 100% in or it. In nine. Yep. And you would just be like, oh my God, you know, I wonder what the jury's going to say about this case. And so, um, you know, all of that is, all of this is to say that, um, you know, we all can take up very serious work and not take ourselves too seriously. And I just hope that um, for other emerging historians, especially people from backgrounds who don't usually get these opportunities that I've been so fortunate to have, that you know you can stay very much who you are and still have a contribution. And I think that this is an amazing time to be able to mentor younger historians and to engage in history focused conversations in a number of places. And that I think is really amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a great way to wrap up the show. Yeah. But there's one more thing we oh, got to yeah, do. One last question. One last mm -hmm. thing we got to do. Okay. So in this day and age, everyone identifies with, um, you know, some sort of spirit animal, right? And you might identify yourself with, um, I was going to say, when, and when you said mom, the first thing that popped in my head was a honey badger, right? And you might identify yourself because you're very protective, right? If you can identify yourself with one spirit ingredient, whether it's used in food or cocktails, what would that ingredient be and why? Oh, gosh. First thing that comes to your head is the best. I, um, uh, one ingredient? Um, 
I would say, um, oh gosh, if I could identify with one ingredient, I would say champagne Ooh. celebration, something that, um, you know, that it's um, Pomery. I was looking at this seminar my sister hosted with the people from Pomery, and they were talking about how um, in France, people understand champagne as the beginning and not the conclusion that you start with something that can open your senses. Um, it's good with French. I'm good with French fries. Champagne <laughs> is good with French fries. So I would say that champagne is um, the co- the the spirit or not spirit. Um, champagne is the cocktail ingredient that I think I most identify with. I go. love that. Do you know, we've never had anyone nope. say champagne. No one says champagne. It's like effervescent. Six years. No beautiful. champagne. Beautiful. It's crisp. It's clean. Also, I want to eat champagne. I'm going to drink champagne and have French fries. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's I know, do it. right? It's so good. In Paris. It's so good. In Paris. Paris. Uh, well, you can do it now. We can. We, do we have to wait till we get to Paris? I mean, we can just go over the bridge right now and just hang out with Marsha and just, just yeah, let's start it. this right now. Yeah. We're coming to your house, Marsha. We'll bring the French fries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for being such an amazing guest, sharing your um, insights. And I so want to be you. You're an amazing person. You are a true inspiration. So thank you for spending your time with us. You are so welcome. Cheers. 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 The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, we craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcast is Roger That a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And while you're there, please don't forget to follow, download, and review the shows. Your reviews help our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.